This is fantastic. Holy shit. Thank you guys so much for coming out. This is, uh, this is better than I could have anticipated. New York City, so glad to do this at home. This is amazing. I've, uh, I've lived in, in and around New York my entire life, and honestly, I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't. New York City, to me, is like the perfect place to audit. Do you know what I mean? Because it's exciting, right? There's lights, it's people, it's energy, it's a little bit of danger. You're like, because oh, then you get to go home. But living here 24-7 amongst the lights, the people, the energy, the little bit of danger. I'm walking around like, I'm about to headbutt everybody in the chest right now. Like, oh, what lady you just cut me off on the sidewalk and slow my day down by half a second? Because I'm going to envision lighting your entire hometown on fire. That's just how I feel from living here my entire life. I have this ball of rage growing inside of me. Right, like it's probably a cluster of tumors, but it's this, it's this ball of rage where I can't even live my everyday life anymore without having constant violent imagery. It's true, like I almost get killed by three to four bicyclists per day. The rest of my hours are spent envisioning Hulk Hogan double leg kicking them right off their fucking bicycles. <laughs> or just sticking a stick right in the front tire and watching some wiener in a onesie flip over their handlebars as I stand on top of them and watch their life leave their body. I think the thing that bothers me the most about New York are like, the babies? <laughs> Not necessarily the babies, but like parents that find the development of their child to be the most adorable process on earth. Do you know what I mean? So they'll walk their kid who can barely walk down the steps of Grand Central during rush hour. This poor kid's barely gripping to the earth. The mom's like boxing people out from passing. She's like, you're doing so good. You're doing great. You don't have anywhere to go, do you? Oh. I just want to fucking blast that kid right in the back of the cerebellum. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is New York City. It's the goddamn major leaks. I don't have time to watch this shitty little kid develop into a real human being. <laughs> Buy him a goddamn step aerobics and have him practice in the living room. <laughs> you can always tell actual New Yorkers at the end of that joke, because they're like, yeah, kick that fucking kid. <laughs> yeah, people from out of town are like, is this still a comedy show? <laughs> I wasn't aware topics would include punting an infant. I'm super happy to be back though. I am, this is, this is the best place because I was just in Allentown, Pennsylvania. The person that said yeah has never been there ever. <laughs> have you been there? What a dog shit town that is, holy fuck. I know Billy Joel has a song about it but I have a few choice words of my own about that place. I'm pretty sure their town motto is drinking while pregnant. I think that's, yeah, I think that's what's written on their municipal building. There are quite a few mutants up in that piece. One of which booked the show I was doing. I was uh, performing in a Ramada Inn because shit is going good. <laughs> and the woman that booked me was like instantly evil, instantly nasty. She sounded like she ate a carton of cool cigarettes. <laughs> and she was about 5'3 by 5'3. <laughs> Just a perfect circle of a person. <laughs> she had the most inexplicable teeth I've ever seen in my entire life. Have you run into this in 2017? Where you're like, oh, you haven't taken advantage of any of the advancements in dentistry <laughs> over the last 100 years because it is fucking mayhem in your mouth. Seriously, how is it post 2K and you look like Captain Jack Sparrow? <laughs> and his bananas. So like three seconds before I go on stage, right? She kind of rolled over to me. <laughs> And she gets right in my ear and she's like, by the way, this is a clean club. This is a no language room. I was like, I don't even know what the fuck that means. <laughs> no language room? What do you want me to fart into the microphone? <laughs> Not even body language? Like what can't, what can I do? So I'm immediately in my head trying to go through the material that I think even fits her criteria. And I get on stage three seconds after I say hello, some dude in the front row who is using his mullet as a beer koozie. <laughs> stood up, heckles me and goes, I think I seen your dick on Snapchat. 
was like, that's now twice in two minutes that I don't know what the fuck any of buddy means. You think you've seen my dick on Snapchat? Well, then I have a question for you, fella. How did you then attach my dick to my face? What physical quality did my penis have where you took one look at me and you're like, I have seen this guy before. I don't know, man. My, my dick might be on Snapchat. I have no idea. I just hope it's represented well. Do we have people on Snapchat? Do you guys use the snaps? Yeah? Are you good at it? Is there a good? Who knows? I use it when I'm only on the toilet, so I call it my snap shits. But if you're unfamiliar with what it is, which I assume you all know, but if you're unfamiliar, it's an application on your smart device where people can take a photo or a video of themselves wearing a dog's face and become substantially more attractive somehow. <laughs> right? Who knew that a dog was that close to me wanting to have sex with it? I had no idea that a canine was but a shaved face and a good jawline away from me wanting to take one down. I got, uh, I got food poisoning leaving Allentown because it's like the devil wanted to keep me there. <laughs> it was kind of my fault though, it was, because I, I, I smoked pot before the ride home like a responsible motor vehicle operator. <laughs> it's not the best idea all the time. Sometimes it helps me, but other times I'll be high and in the middle of a long drive and just been like, I don't feel like doing this anymore. <laughs> yeah, driving, I get it. Turn, turn, pedal, pedal. Take the wheel, Jesus. I don't give a shit. <laughs> That's not what happened, lucky enough, but I did qu get quite hungry really quickly. <laughs> So I turned off to the first truck stop about eight minutes into my ride and I went straight to a Roy Rogers. Oh. Yeah, I'm not even certain that that's an active fast food chain anymore. <laughs> this one in particular, pretty sure it closed in the 90s and they just never told their employees. <laughs> there is no way it was up to code. They're famous for their chicken though. Do you think I ordered their chicken? No, no because that would have taken two minutes. <laughs> I come from a long line of impatient Irish idiots that require instant gratification. It's true, like my grandpa is famous for taking bacon off of the pan while it's cooking and trying to eat it while cooling it in his mouth. At the same time, like literally like, oh. like he's pelican swallowing a grease fire. Just. So I run in there, it's 11 a.m., I run directly to the heat lamp and I grab a double bacon cheeseburger right from under that thing and I eat it in three seconds while tweeting about how it was the greatest decision of my life. I had to amend that tweet three hours later. Be like, just a heads up everybody, I am now pissing out of my asshole. I would have been better off eating the grass on the side of the road. But good news now, I get to catch up on all my snap shits. Yeah, rub one out to a lamb. <laughs> good though, you know, it's good that you guys are booze and I like that type of crowd. I like crowds that are fucking lubricated and amped up. I'm currently in the middle of like a long hiatus from, from drinking. I do that every once in a while, just take breaks just to prove I have control. Like I did sober January this year. Anybody ever go through that Vietnam? <laughs> what a nightmare. I did soaps Jan and soaps Feb. Super boring, but I was popping weed edibles like they're fucking multivitamins. <laughs> yeah, just all day, every day, talking to God on a Tuesday. It's been fun. I've been high around kids a lot lately. It's weed and it's kids I know. I'm not like smoking angel dust and showing up to a playground. Like, <laughs> Just start chewing through a seesaw. That's not what I'm doing. No, it's weed and it's kids I've already met. And I got to tell you, not only do I recommend it, I think it should be mandatory <laughs> for adults to be high around kids. I do. I've never connected with people more in my entire life. Everybody was on the exact same level. It was amazing. We were all experiencing so much wonderment. It was beautiful. My godson told me a nine minute story about the color of his goldfish and I was fucking riveted. <laughs> yeah, the color's in the name, but I'm on the edge of my seat like, yeah, yeah. 
What else? <laughs> Before I did comedy, I did tours and birthday parties at the Museum of Natural History. It's the best gig ever, because I would go stone to the gills and just introduce children to dinosaurs. <laughs> You've never felt more like God <laughs> in your entire life. There I am just shepherding around these young minds. They're like, I'm high, so I'm like, fucking wow! <laughs> right? We're here, they used to be. We went into that planetarium, the big domed movie theater. We're learning about the creation of the universe. These poor kids are overstimulated. I'm already on Saturn. <laughs> Morgan Freeman's sweet voice is just tickling my earlobes. I turn to one of these kids. I'm like, you think it's true? Do you think this is an ever-expanding abyss? So I'm kind of... Yeah. And we're on this rock, just kind of hurtling through a pointless existence. The kid's like... <laughs> when snack time? I'm like, in an hour, but I got bad news. I already ate all your Dunkaroos. <laughs> I am starving. Kids are on the forefront of my mind lately. They are. I just got married like nine months ago. Which I'm oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, even though statistically it was a terrible decision. <laughs> but my wife's put in her time. She has her 10,000 hours. <laughs> it's true. We've been together for a very long time. We're both 32 years old. We've been dating since we were 10. Yeah, I know. No, in all fairness, though, it's, in, in all fairness, it's been on and off, so I have HPV and stuff, but seriously. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I've never been tested. But... Uh, <laughs> All I mean by that is that we've each lived a life, right? It would be psychotic if neither of us ever dated anybody else, just like incubated from the outside world. Just, no, anybody outside of this bubble is a nightmare. No, I've dated other people. She's dated a black guy, which I'm super proud of. Right? Yeah, because I'm still filling her up, so that feels... Yeah, come on, follow... Following a marquee headliner like that and I'm still hitting all the walls, that feels pretty good. I'm not saying I hit them at the same time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's unfortunately not a simultaneous strike. <laughs> When we have sex, it kind of looks like I'm ringing the dinner bell. <laughs> yeah, honestly, if you're not laughing hard at that, it's because your imagination failed. So picture me inside my wife. Just doing anything in a desperate attempt for her to feel something. I'm, I'm like, honestly, I'm like an anti-marriage guy. Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not into the whole thing. If I, the only way I would get married is if I've known the person since they were a child. And I was also a child. <laughs> Let's close that loophole quite quickly. <laughs> but it's funny, because some of my friends, like, I don't get it. Some people that I know, they met somebody in their 30s, they dated for 18 months, and then they legally obligated themselves to that person. I'm like, dude, are you sure? Six seasons ago, you had no idea who that person was. <laughs> you don't know how she'll react to her second winter. <laughs> or what she'll do in a leap year. <laughs> that extra day might be the only thing holding her together. <laughs> you just gotta make sure that you can even make it through the planning process, right? That was the most stressful part of our entire relationship. Like, I didn't really participate a lot, but my wife looked like she had a full load. <laughs> She is, like, I have nothing to add. She's a floral designer and a fashion designer. What am I gonna say? Like, oh, those napkins could be different. Like, what? <laughs> I have nothing to add to that equation, but I could tell there were times where she was getting frustrated and considering killing me. <laughs> no, like, legit. Like, she's a fiery Italian woman, so murder is always on the menu. <laughs> and I made the mistake. I, like, jokingly asked her how she would do it. Like, how would you end my life, my love? She just looked at me, laughed for an hour, and then never responded. <laughs> yeah. 
It's like, well, that was the most fr frightening response he could have possibly given. So now it's all under the umbrella of possibility. We had some fun, though, in the lead-up. I had a good bachelor party. I went camping in upstate New York. Pretty wild. Thanks, one whistler. I appreciate that. My wife had a bachelorette. She went to Puerto Rico. Fair swap, I think. <laughs> It's so funny, every single woman, when I tell them my wife went to Puerto Rico for her bachelorette, they have the same exact response. They're like, oh, that's beautiful. She deserves it. All my friends, my guy friends, when I told them she went to Puerto Rico, they're like, hope she's not down there blowing a soccer team. <laughs> like, yeah, I too hope that, what the fuck? <laughs> Didn't even realize that was on the menu. Now all I can do is picture her face first in a plate of burnt plantains. <laughs> Finishing each one off individually. <laughs> I'm a little sour on the whole trip. Like, nothing went wrong, but she did something that I thought was very irresponsible because her and none of her friends had ever been there before. And instead of doing the all-inclusive resort, which seems like the safe, reasonable thing to do, they all just Airbnb'd a random place. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what do you want to be in Taken 19? Like, is that... Because <laughs> I don't have a particular set of skills. <laughs> so if you get took, that shit's on you, boo-boo. <laughs> literally all I could think of the entire time she was gone. Because I was on mushrooms that whole weekend. Yeah, I was like, holy shit, she's going to get kidnapped and then sold into sex slavery. Right? But then I remembered she was 30, so there's no risk of that. It's so funny, because women are the only people that get offended about aging out of the sex trade. Like, oh, you don't think I'm fresh enough? You don't think I can't get kidnapped by a Russian <laughs> and stuffed into a shipping container? <laughs> we had a good honeymoon, though. That was amazing. Went to Bali on our honeymoon. which we, Yeah, which was sick, because I can't afford Baltimore. <laughs> and, like, you guys had name recognition of what that place was. I had no idea, and my wife sold it to me in such a psychotic way. Seriously, I, I didn't know. It's on the other side of the earth. It's a completely different culture. It was literally 24 hours in the air. And this is how my wife sold it to me. She's like, seriously, just listen. She has a really deep voice. Seriously, just listen. It's going to be the trip of a lifetime. The weather's incredible. The food is amazing. But just a heads up, the water's like infested with sharks. I'm like, why would you attach that to your sales pitch? knowing that my biggest fear in the entire world is to be eaten by a shark. It is, which is a weird fear for me to have because I live in Brooklyn. So I'm very rarely in the crosshairs of a shark. Yeah, like I have some city fears. My biggest New York City fear is definitely to be pushed in front of a subway. But I figured out why. It's because I spend the majority of my commute thinking about pushing people in front of a subway. So somebody else has to be thinking it too and probably have far more ambition than I. Second biggest New York City fear is that a pigeon flies in my mouth and gives me AIDS. Yeah. It's a real fear. I didn't say it was going to be reasonable. It's what I think about any time I see one of those wet rats with wings flying towards me. I feel like it's going to fly into my mouth and I'm going to rapidly lose weight. But a shark, what a nightmare, right? Not a lot of people share this fear with me and not a lot of people spend time ruminating over what it would be like to be torn apart by an apex predator. So let me paint a picture for you. If you've never thought about it, being eaten by a shark is like being eaten by a lion. Now add drowning to that. Right? Because at least the lion has a decency to give you one last gasp of God's great air. A shark is eating you alive, pulling you underwater while you also can't breathe. Which one do you even address first? Oh, no, I'm being eaten, but also... <laughs> oh, this thing just bit my penis off like a chicken nugget, yet still... <laughs> I know, which is a tough one for women to relate to. Because <laughs> you have a clam, that's a different dish. But I figured out why. I figured out why more people don't share this fear with me. And it's because human beings are literally the only animal that are cocky enough to think they know how to take down a shark. Right? How do you stop a shark? What do you do? Yeah. What? Just punch it in the nose. 
Don't be a baby. Just punch it. Just punch this giant monster traveling 55 miles per hour at your mouth agape. Just what? Just punch it right in the... Just punch... Why don't you punch a Ford Taurus? See how much that slows it down. Right? And all of a sudden, every person is the most precision puncher of all time. Most people have never thrown a punch on dry land. Now you're in the water. This killing machine's natural habitat. Your tooties aren't even touching the floor. This thing is knifing through the waves, mouth open, rows of razor sharp fangs, and you're just like... <laughs> right, it's not even a full punch either. It's an under the water, slow motion punch. <laughs> like you're dreaming. What do you think that punch is gonna do? You think you're gonna hit the shark, it's gonna turn over and then float to the top of the ocean? <laughs> then you just split the waves and Moses walk your way? Thanks. Four of you really like applause, and I appreciate that. I feel it in my heart. This guy especially. Thank you. My, uh, my wife was actually going through her woman week while we were on our honeymoon. No, I don't mind, because I like to get filthy. But she kept going in the water, which I had a huge problem with. Yeah. She's like, what? I'm like, are you kidding? You're literally chumming. <laughs> yeah. Get out of here. I'm not following you into the shallows and have a goddamn sand shark bite my kneecap off. You can ride that crimson wave alone, lady. <laughs> I, uh, I almost did mushrooms while I was in Bali but I didn't because I found out the punishment for drugs was death by firing squad. <laughs> Figure that might not be the best thing I see while I'm hallucinating. <laughs> not to mention, like, I love mushrooms. They're my favorite drug in the entire world, but I think I need a little time off after the last time I did them because I made the mistake of double dipping. I did two trips in one day. Real amateur move. <laughs> little day trip and a night trip with in and of itself sounds like a delightful evening. Not so much when you put it into practice. <laughs> The day trip was amazing. I was with two of my best friends. They're long-term girls. We had this amazing day where we connected as friends deeper. The nature was unbelievable. Every color was vibrant. We loved each other. And then my friend took out a crossbow. I was like, oh, you've never seen an anti-drug commercial once in your entire life. Because this typically ends with one of us wearing that in the middle of our foreheads. Just being like, it was supposed to be a day of fun. He took, I mean, he, he took out the crossbow almost right away. Like, right after we ate it, he took it off. So it didn't technically hit it until it got to me. <laughs> like, he took it out. He shot it. My friend shot it. The two women shot it. And then it got to me, and that's starting, that's when I started to feel a little fuzzy. <laughs> so he handed it to me, completely loaded, cocked. And I grabbed it, and I turned, and I went... <laughs> <laughs> no aiming, no pointing, no nothing. It flew through his backyard, through a neighbor's backyard, and landed on an empty child's swing. I'm totally kidding, I'm kidding. It hit a kid right in the chest. <laughs> but that was the fun part of the trip. That was an amazing time during the day. And then once it turned to night, that's when things got dark, both metaphorically and physically. Because, again, we were about to take our second serving and my friend Tim goes, all right, by the way, my frat brother Ken's coming. He's a wild card. <laughs> I'm like, oh, awesome. That's exactly what you want to hear when you're about to open your soul to the universe. <laughs> you want to hear, hey, dude, somebody's coming that you've never met before and he's capable of anything. <laughs> well, all right, bring him in. <laughs> I suppose. This kid, true to form, walks in the door, takes a look at the two girlfriends, goes, didn't know there was gonna be whores here. I was gonna take you assholes to the strip club. Which, yeah, insult to the women aside, he wanted to go to the strip club on mushrooms. I can't think of a less erotic thing in the entire world. That wouldn't be hot, that would just be us sitting there like, ah, these are somebody's daughters. Electra, climb down off of there. Sit down next to me. We got to talk. Figure out where your life veered off. 
So we get past that, right? We start parceling out all the mushrooms. This kid, again, goes, I want to scare myself to death. <laughs> Grabs six grams, sticks them in his face. Yeah, which for those of you who aren't sitting right in front of me, <laughs> six grams is basically the amount you want to take if you want to look God directly in the eyes. <laughs> it is an intense amount. So we all take a normal amount. This kid takes a heroic dose. Which, by the way, this is also my favorite part of mushrooms. Like, my favorite part isn't even the trip. I love the trip. That's super fun. But my favorite part is the moment of panic that happens right after you initially eat them. Do you know what I mean? Where you eat them and you're like, yep, this is going to happen now, whether I want it to or not. <laughs> all right. Yeah. It's like strapping yourself into a roller coaster and you feel that first click up the hill. And you're like, oh, I couldn't get out of this even if I wanted to now. This is absolutely happening. So this kid eats six grams, right? And this was his reaction. For four hours, he just screamed at the top of his lungs. I can't stress this enough, because I feel like you guys are normal people, so you probably think that means he screamed and like took a break and then re-screamed. Nay. Not on this night. For four straight hours, this kid was just, he took his shirt off, he started like ape hitting himself. He was saying super profound things like, you couldn't if you cancel, you won't. It got to the point where he was flailing so violently that we had to stick him inside. And my buddy's entire front of his house is made of glass. So we're basically watching a zoo exhibit of a crazy person. Melting down, yelling, hitting, going, you are what you eat unless it's your feet. <laughs> For four hours! <laughs> Finally, after four hours, he like kind of gathered himself, walked towards the door, figured out how the knob works, <laughs> opened up the door, came outside, looked at me, goes, <sighs> sat in a chair next to me, lit up a cigarette and goes, <sighs> I think the mushrooms just kicked in. <laughs> I'm like, I don't think so, buddy. I think there might be a gap, approximately four hours, missing from your memory where you were literally rocketing through the galaxy. But hey, good to have you back. Good to see you again. I don't know, I prefer like, you know, organic hallucinogens and stimulants to alcohol just because of vanity. Like I said, they don't do anything to me physically. And booze, I have, I, I have awful Irish genetics, so my blood and everything just soaks it up real quick. Like if I have like four beers, I look like a water balloon with bones. <laughs> I do, there's some structure, but it's mostly viscosity. <laughs> and it's moving at a rapid pace. It is, I, I don't know, I'm hard on myself about my body. I'm like, you know, I look fine right now, but underneath here, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I wouldn't, I used to have a real good body. I was on steroids in junior college. Yeah, I swear to God, I was playing junior college basketball and I couldn't quite keep up athletically with the rest of the community college commits. So I was like, wow, I might need an edge. Here's the thing, steroids almost killed me, but I would recommend them to each and every one of you here tonight because that year of power was fucking worth it. It was, it was incredible. I almost died when I was squatting in a Planet Fitness. I was like a goddamn silverback gorilla. I had smelling salts in my pockets. I was literally like, <laughs> came up, tore my ab, tore my groin, got a hernia, the weights fell on top of me, and I threw up all over the floor. <laughs> Anybody in here ever throw up on the floor of a Planet Fitness before? Because that's supposed to be a judgment-free zone. I felt a lot of judgment that day. Crab walking out of the gym with vomit all over my free t-shirt. <laughs> Planet Fitness is like the exact same thing as a therapist that purposefully gives you bad advice so you continue to come back. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Bagel Mondays, Pizza Fridays, fucking Tootsie Rolls at the front desk. It's like, oh, you don't want me to get fit. You want me to lose a foot. Holy shit. <laughs> you have no interest in me prolonging my life. 
But I don't know. So the boozing thing, I, I, I could just tell it's having like wear and tear on me. Just when I went to vote, I like I got a real dose of reality and truth. I walked into Crown Heights, Brooklyn, first time I ever voted there, and the black woman right behind the table, before taking my name or anything, she just looked at me and she goes, "Yo, you look young and old at the same damn time." <laughs> I was like, holy shit, that was the most accurate description I've ever heard. I spent the rest of the day staring in the mirror. Like, what did she mean by that? And she was right, because I have kind of like boyish eyes, a little bit of a dimple, and then the hair of somebody that just got done burying their children. So I totally get it. I don't know, it's like, for me, drinking, drinking now, it's like a little easier to take time off, because it's less fun now that I'm married. It is, because I didn't know that my social obligations outside of my apartment would continue once I'm with the same person for a long amount of time. I didn't realize I still had to leave the house and do stuff, but it turns out that just amplifies over time. Like, my wife still loves going out, loves hitting the bars. I can't think of a more pointless endeavor than going to a bar with my wife. Why would we ever go to a bar together? We've already met. I would much rather drink for cheap in my living room and then still get turned down for sex. Like that's... Yeah. <laughs> Why am I whining and dining for the exact same outcome? It's pointless. Going to a bar with your wife is like going hunting with an already dead carcass over your shoulder. <laughs> Seriously, what's the point? What are you just showing the other animals what could have been? Like... Oh, don't be selfish. You got your meat. Go home. <laughs> Plus, you know, it changes over time. You go through different, like, you know, different routines as a couple. You go through different phases. Like, we used to be the booze couple. That's what we'd do. We'd go out, get liquored up, get fucking weird. <laughs> that was our thing. But now it's gotten to the point where she's maturing. <laughs> So she'll get mad at me for being drunk when we're drinking together. <laughs> yeah, the two of us will literally both be ingesting alcohol at the same time and she's like, you're fucking drunk. <laughs> you're drunk. I'm like, I thought that's what we were doing. <laughs> Ugh, I didn't realize we we're having an unspoken competition of who could fight off the effects of alcohol the longest. <laughs> Had I known, I would have brought some meth. Right? Just straighten myself out, do a blast off a switchblade, just walk through the wall of the bar. <laughs> out onto the street and then eat a homeless person. <laughs> I'm not drunk, honey, I'm just pouring some adobo on a hobo. <laughs> you guys are awesome. I think I've, I've also just like aged out of the cute phase of drinking. Do you know what I mean? It's no longer fun for me to drink like I like to drink. It's cute for a 20, 22 year old or something like that to like wake up on a Sunday, just, you know, oh wow, I wonder what happened last night. I should text my, you know, check my text, see really what happened. <laughs> it's a little bit different for me, somebody at 32 to wake up on a Sunday covered in blood. Like, I really need to find out what the fuck happened last night. I better check my texts. <laughs> I don't know, I think I had like my last drunk story, last real drunk story, it was on this, I was, I was coming home from a club, from one of the, you know, show or whatever, it was late at night, I was hammered drunk and I fell asleep on the A train, like a little baby boy. <laughs> Just completely knocked out, which I'm not sure if you, guys, if you guys know, you're not supposed to do that because people are cutting out your wallet from your pocket. <laughs> and then making away with your savings. <laughs> That's not what happened to me, but what happened to me might be a little worse. I was, just, I was deep in REM, super asleep, and I guess my brain and my body went into autopilot because it thought I was at home in bed with my girl, drunk. So what do I typically do when it's late at night and I'm in, in bed at home with my girl? I'll throw a move at her. <laughs> So on the train, I just reach down into the lap 
of the giant black man sitting next to me. <laughs> Straight up rolled the elevator to the top floor, almost drove stick. <laughs> Have you guys ever woken up in the middle of an argument? Because up until that point, I never had. I woke up, this guy's screaming in my face. I'm like, <laughs> Do you think I apologized to him? No. No, I sure didn't. I got aggressive right back because frankly, I wasn't awake for the first part of the transaction. So I thought he was being unreasonable. So like, you don't yell at me, I'll yell at you! And I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this, but two men yelling at each other doesn't typically, you know, quell the aggression. It can amplify, right? So at this point, my friend who was sitting across from me, who I completely forgot about, got up and interjected and he's like, dude, I'm sure whatever he did, he just thought it was me. I was like, he tried to jerk me off. My friend was like, yeah, that's actually not part of our relationship at all. <laughs> so I understand your frustration. <laughs> so he keeps screaming, I keep screaming. It amplifies even more to the point where my friend got scared and he pulled out a knife. <laughs> and it wasn't just any knife either. It was a knife that he just got from a bachelor party that had his full name engraved on it. <laughs> Is there a more identifiable murder weapon in the entire world? How could he better attach that to himself if he like sprinkled some hair on it and jizzed on the blade? Like that's... Like, oh, I certainly know who this belongs to. So the guy realizes he's dealing with two unhinged human beings. Decides to get up and go to the other end of the train, which should be the end of the story, right? But again, nay. Right at this point, some old 60-year-old hipster, some guy that looks like he makes homemade mayonnaise, stood up and decided this was the best time to give me an intervention. That's the confidence of somebody that has never been punched in the fucking face. <laughs> to inject himself in my knife fight? Like, are you kidding? So I just start screaming at him because that's what I was doing that night. And I'm not proud of this story even though it's a good bit. But this is the one moment I am proud of because as we're yelling at each other, the train is pulling into my station and I guess I just kind of snapped out of it. As the train is pulling into my stop, I look at the guy and I go, listen, if I ever see you on this train again, I'm gonna fall asleep and give you a hand job. <laughs> I'm not looking forward to telling that story to my kids. You know what I mean? I don't know. That's why I, I, I the kid thing, I'm not, I, I'm not sure if I'm ready yet. I, right now, I get the appeal though. I understand why people have kids. Do you know what I mean? It's basically like watching a mini you have a mulligan at life. <laughs> it's like, well, I didn't do much with this. Let's see how you do out there, kiddo. <laughs> but right now I'm having such a good time watching my friends have kids because it's such an interesting contrast in, uh, from who I know them to be. Do you know what I mean? They're good parents, but they're pieces of shit. <laughs> It's just weird to watch them get all into it and be like, ha 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 ha, want a kiwi? It's like, well, five years ago, we were doing coke off a toilet seat together. I'm pretty sure your wife was pregnant at the time. We had 30 beers when we built your crib. It's fun to watch the, the evolution, though, of the parenting because it's so different than how we came up, as it should be, right? Things should change over time, but, like, my friends are, like, aggressive about it, like, super in your face about anti-hitting, like, no hitting, which I agree with. I don't think you should hit your kids. But I've met kids that have never been hit before, and their arrogance is fucking infuriating. <laughs> Love my godson to death, four years old, beautiful kid. He's been told he's been loved, never been struck his entire life. He had the confidence and self-esteem the other day to correct me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not feeling that shit at all. <laughs> He's like, uh, no, no, Uncle Mikey, let me explain. I was like, oh yeah, Poof. I wanted to chop him right in the throat. <laughs> Give him a little chop, a little chop. That's a perfect bit of child abuse, just a chop. 
because it doesn't leave a mark, but it briefly cuts their air supply. <laughs> so they know you mean business. I don't want him becoming some 60-year-old on a train, waking up somebody who just <laughs> almost sexually assaulted a stranger. I got hit as a kid, look how good I turned out. <laughs> right, fighting for the affection of a room full of people. That's no hole in here. I did get hit, I didn't get hit excessively, but I got hit enough for me to remember the last time. I do, I remember it as if it was a badge of honor. I was 15 years old, my mom was chasing me up the steps with her three rings facing in. Yeah, but again, I'm 15 though, so I'm basically like a strong, independent woman. <laughs> and I remember having that realization as I was running from my mother. I was like, wait a second, I'm, I'm too powerful for this. So I turned like J-Lo in Enough. I was like, this ends now! My mom threw a hand at me, I caught it. She threw another hand at me, I caught it. I go, what now, Kate? I know, I watched the confidence drain from her face. Cause she just realized her baby boy was too big to beat. So she screamed for my father. She goes, Kevin! Michael just tried to throw me down the stairs. She fucking lied while staring me in the eyes. The woman that brought me into this world and my dad is six foot two, 265, asleep in his bedroom like a goddamn polar bear. He hears his name and is like <laughs> Just starts ambling up the steps. I sprint up the steps, slam the door behind me. My dad fucking Kool-Aid mans right through the door. shatters it. Stepped right on my masturbation towel. That was immediately by my door and rock hard so it acted like road spikes. So there's my dad in full fifth gear sprint. He catches a flat, turns around to see what it is, sees my towel snapped in half, turns back to me, raises his hand, dry heaves, walks out and I was never hit ever again. Yeah, just classic Irish Catholic parenting. Inject some sex in there and we'll never bring that up ever again. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't have no kids yet, but we have, we have cats. And I would never hit them for fear of reprisal. <laughs> there are times where I see it hop up on the refrigerator. I'm like, this thing could eat me alive if it wanted to. <laughs> Holy shit. I'm not a cat guy at all, though. I'm not. My, I got surprised by cats, which that's how you want to jump into a 20-year commitment, right? <laughs> you want to be surprised. The day I moved in with my wife, before we were married, before everything, she's like, all right, those boxes go over there. That box goes behind the couch. Uh, the cat will be here tomorrow. I was like, what? She's like, yeah, the cat. I already told you this. <laughs> yeah, which mostly women laugh at because you know as soon as you say that, you win the fight. <laughs> Right? Because chances are she did tell me that. But due to the constant stream of content that's flying out of her fucking face, chances are I might miss a thing or two. Yeah, I don't know if you know this, ladies, but if you talk 98% of the time, eventually the frequency of your voice is gonna fade in with traffic. We were, uh, we were at least given the cats, though, because that's how you get them. <laughs> right? Has anybody in here ever spent money on a cat? I have never been in Petco and watched somebody walk in and they're just like, yes, I'll take one cat, please. I would like your finest feline. No, you're either given one or there's a box on the side of the road. Or one shows up at your doorstep with half its face eaten off and it's like, Wah! take care of me. Why spend money when you don't gotta? I smoke pot with my cats, though. 
I do. I don't want. I don't want to make it seem that let I'm like some maniac that's like blowing hits into their ear. That's not what I mean. I mean I enjoy smoking pot. They apparently like the ambiance, so then they come and sit on my lap, right? Which is nice because it's a bit of camaraderie. But cats are the worst stone partner you could ever ask for. I've been high and looked into my cat's eyes and saw some uncomfortable truths I wasn't willing to come to terms with. Right there, a shifty, demonic creature. When you're sober. Now all of a sudden I'm like stoned, vulnerable, thinking about heaven. My cat's on my lap out of nowhere, will just get up, start darting back and forth in the living room. I'm like, what is it? Is it a ghost? What's happening? Just climbs up on my chest, starts tracing spirits around my head. I'm like, who is it? Is it Pup Up? Is it Pup Up? Is he proud of me? Cat's like, no! <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to invite anybody else into our marriage. <laughs> I think we're doing good. It's us two cats. We both like what we're doing. Like, this is the best job in the entire world. I can't even believe I get to do this. This is the best. Because I've done shitty work in my entire life. I, I, I bust tables for a long time. I waited tables, bartended. I did construction. I coached gymnastics for several years. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know gymnastics. <laughs> I can't even touch my toes. Literally walked into the gym and I was like, hey, do you guys need a janitor? They're like, how would you like to spot children on the uneven bars? <laughs> You're goddamn right I would. <laughs> and then I had sex with one of the mothers and I was asked never to come back again. <laughs> yeah, less of a joke, more of me just getting that information out there <laughs> to whoever will listen. Worst job I ever had though, for sure, I was somebody's personal assistant for a long time. That was kind of brutal because you have to take instruction from somebody that you don't necessarily respect. <laughs> Regardless of how intel intelligent or you know, successful they are, it doesn't matter, they're always talking down so it feels bad on your soul. And my guy had like hardcore cross eyes. <laughs> Which I'm not judging, but somebody certainly should have warned me with that information before meeting him. Don't you think that's pertinent? So just be like, just a heads up, the guy you works for looks like he smoked a pillowcase of angel dust. So you might want to pick an eye and stick with it. Instead, I walked into the office, he's like, what's up, dude, how you doing? I'm like, oh, what eye do I go with? They're both rolling in. Do I go left, do I go right, do I go bridge of the nose or straight up back wall? I don't fucking know. I had to get him lunch every single day, which isn't a big deal. I'm not above that type of work, but he would order some bullshit. This is New York City. It's some of the greatest food in the entire world, and he would order the same thing every single day. He would get a wrap, one slice of turkey, one slice of cheese, light lettuce, one stripe of mayo, and four olives. I had to order that edible blunt. In the middle of a bustling New York City deli during fucking rush hour. Do you understand what it's like to put in an order for dainty finger food when there's 65 construction workers bellying up to the counter? Just being like, I don't know what this pussy's having, but I'll take 88 bacon, egg, and cheeses, 95 coffees, get this half a fag, another cold taquito. I don't know, as long as we, you know, keep doing what we love, that should work. I, I'm, not, I'm not concerned with divorce, I'm not. I mean, even though it might happen, who knows? I don't care. It doesn't bother me. My parents got a divorce after 25 years. 25 years, that's a long time to be together and be like, I think we fucked up a quarter of a century ago. I fear we made an irreversible life mistake. Back then. So it doesn't scare me, but it kind of makes me paranoid about what could potentially come up in the future that could destroy us, right? Because we haven't been through everything together. We've never been robbed together. We've never been victims of a home invasion together. Those are relationship defining events. They are, because the best case scenario of both of those things happening is that I get murdered immediately. Yeah, because that way my wife doesn't get to see exactly what type of man I really am. A guy busts in with a gun, that's gonna expose some shit. Just, nobody move! I'm just instantly in the corner pissing myself. Give him whatever he wants, I don't wanna die. 
start panicking, just offer up my wife. I'm like, she could cook, but a little mousy. <laughs> the guy leaves, we're both unscathed, and I'd be like, whoa, that was kind of crazy, right? <laughs> Super weird that that happens. I have to pretend to be a man again around my wife after she sees me like that. Even further down the line, I might have to try to dominate her sexually. After she sees me like that, like, yeah, take it, baby, take it. Oh, you mean like how that guy took all of our stuff? Is that... Is that how I should take it? I think we're good, though. As long as, you know, as long as we keep the kid thing in frame and keep doing what we like to do and we never film ourselves having sex again. <laughs> Holy shit, we did that like a couple months ago. That was a dark day in my life. <laughs> I would not recommend that to anybody here because up until this point, I've had a very specific view and image of what I think I look like while having sex. <laughs> but upon review of the game tape, <laughs> that just isn't the case. In my head, I've been Fabio on the front cover of a romance novel. <laughs> just gorgeous hair blowing in the breeze. I have abs, those weird kind of cum gutters. Do you know what I mean? The <laughs> The V right down to the goods. I have a lot of hips, a lot of rhythm, a lot of hips. Yeah. The noise coming out of me is very harmonic, just oh. <laughs> Nope. I don't have abs, what I do have is a gelatinous front butt orb <laughs> that kind of hangs over and eclipses the majority of my dick. I have that. I don't have hips or rhythm, what I do have are apparent seizures on top of my wife. <laughs> I look like an animal dying in the desert on top of her. <laughs> Pro tip for anybody who's thinking about doing it, don't hold the phone close to your face. <laughs> Those noises I thought were musical and beautiful were more like, oh, you're so pretty. Oh, I love this. I swear to God, I tried to masturbate to my own sex tape. I did, I tried to jerk off to my own wife like a goddamn American hero. Yeah. But my body, noises, and performance were such a bummer that I lost an erection while jerking off to myself. My curdled bag of milk body walked into frame and my penis turned to putty in my palm. And there was no resurrecting it. It's fine though, it's, it's a good thing. <laughs> I'm, try I'm trying to quit porn anyway. I am, the consumption, not the business. <laughs> I don't know if you could tell, I don't have a plan B in these skinny pantalones. It's tough though, because it's so weird, you know, I, thinking about it, I've been consuming porn every day since I was 12 years old. It's like one of the most consistent things I've ever done. <laughs> And it's so interesting to see young people kind of deal with it now because like 21 year old kids right now, once they got into puberty, the internet has already been an established thing, right? There's like almost a book of etiquette. They understand how to navigate it. They get there and it's a written rule thing. You know what you're doing. Back when we first had the internet, I was on AOL in chat rooms, <laughs> talking to like 56 year old divorced women, just being like, try anal, that'll spice up your marriage. <laughs> Not realizing it was probably a 60-year-old dude with a belt around his neck being like, I will try that! <laughs> it was the Wild West! It was, I remember, we knew so little about the internet. When I was in eighth grade, I AOL searched for eighth grade girls naked. <laughs> yeah, I just innocently wanted to see girls my age naked, not realizing I was signing myself up for a lifetime of sexual surveillance. <laughs> Yeah, but it was my friend's parents' AOL account, so they had to deal with Chris Hansen. <laughs> it is, though. I, I have been consuming it for a long time, so it's been difficult to, to cut off and stop because I can't quit cold turkey because I'll shake. <laughs> so I've had to, like, methadone my way off. But it's tough. Don't do it like me if you ever try. I did it by medium. So I went from TV to computer to cell phone. As if the smaller it got, the less it would mean to me. <laughs> don't masturbate to your cell phone, dude. I don't know why I'm making eye contact with you personally. <laughs> but I did it the other day, right? I had my phone in my left, my goods at my right. 
right at the penultimate moment, right when the fireworks were about to go off, my friend Dan Hersham calls. <laughs> and my phone is hooked to Facebook, so his dumb picture popped up too. And I was like, no! No! Oh, is that what made me come? I picked up the phone, I'm like, Dan, it feels so good to hear from you. <laughs> I had to defriend him on Facebook after that. Every time I scrolled past his picture, fucking Pavlov's dog. <laughs> but I am, I'm trying to embrace 2K17 and all of the masturbatory positivities that come along with that. I am, like I just bought myself one of these fleshlights. <laughs> This fella, dead center, knows exactly what that is. Good for you. Dude, I remember when I was... How old are you, dude? Uh, 26. 26, exactly. When I was... Like, we have that five-year gap or seven-year gap, whatever. I can't do math this quickly. But when I was a kid, I used to build my own pocket pussies out of soccer socks, a trash bag, and my sister's foot cream. It wasn't off of her foot. Like, that was... It was still in the bottle. But now they come pre-made, it's amazing. If you guys don't know what a flashlight is, it's a pocket pussy that's in the shape of a flashlight. Got real quiet in here. <laughs> it's just what it is, I didn't invent it. What sucks is it doesn't have that dual function. It'd be so much better. I'm a shameful Irish Catholic masturbator. I do it in the dark corners of my home. If I could be doing it and I hear a floorboard creak and then go, who goes there? That'd be perfect. Be even better if it was a black light. Catch those rogue loads we sometimes shoot. Comb the entire room, just... Oh, it's all over my cat. It's funny, a lot of, a lot of the women withdrew their support of the show right when I started talking about this. Because you guys forgotten that you've had access to dildos and vibrators forever. Well, guess what? It's our goddamn turn. We got next. You were all totally fine. Recently during a show, this one woman sitting right in the front row got so pissed off that this item existed and that I was talking about it. She stood up, interrupted the whole show, interrupted the bit and was like, oh what, so you don't like real pussy? You wouldn't prefer real pussy? You don't like real pussy? And I'm like, no, because sometimes it comes attached to a voice like that. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for coming out. Really appreciate it, thank you.